Today, we will be making a sweet sherry. I really love my sherries I do. One of the reasons I love making a sherry is there's opportunity to do things that you wouldn't normally do in the wine making process. But I'll go into that later on in this video. And if you're enjoying these wine making videos, please subscribe down below. And I'd really appreciate it. Sherry, yes. There are two types of sherry. You have your dry sherry and your sweet sherry. The process is different for a dry sherry or a sweet sherry. A sweet sherry is easier to make than a dry sherry. There are less complicated steps, but I will be making a dry sherry as well at a later date. Because once you've mastered the art of making a sweet sherry, a dry sherry is only one step further in difficulty. Making a sherry is no different than making a wine. Few things are slightly different, but I'll go into that as the video and recipe progresses. So first thing you need to do is choose your base element, your base flavor for the sherry. There are things that work really well without using specialized specialist wine grapes or sherry grapes. The things that I find make awesome sherries are parsnips, raisins, rice, apricots, peaches, all these things lend themselves to making a great sherry base. Also a great wine as well. You can make fantastic wines out of all of these things. The methodology is no different. You just need to work out how many parsnips equate to peaches, for example, or apricots or raisins or rice. But that comes down just to fine tuning the recipe. There are recipes out there online. I will link a few recipes down below to the different type of sherries you can make out of these things I've just mentioned. For this recipe, I'm going to be using tinned peaches, simply because they are probably the most accessible out of all those to everyone, and they aren't seasonal dependent. If you want to make parsnip sherry, then best to do it in winter. As for rice, raisins, anytime, just like tinned peaches. But tinned peaches is what I have at hand right now. So why don't we jump that side of the camera to the workbench and we'll get this sherry started. Come on then. Peach sherry, fantastic. I used to make a lot of this years and years ago and then I stopped making sherry for some reason. I don't know why I stopped. But I'm getting back into my sherries. I like modifying wines. If you can hear that annoying fly, then I do apologize. It's mid-season, it's fly season up here. I will give you a tip at the end of the video on how to keep flies away from your homebrew. So keep watching for that one. First thing you need is four tins of peaches. If you want to use tinned apricots instead of peaches, just the same recipe, just buy a different tin. So four tins, that is roughly two kilos of fruit and the sugar juice as well that they're in. Make sure that there are no preservatives in the tin. Citric acid, is fine, but you don't want any other preservatives because that's going to interfere with your yeast. First thing you want to do is open up your four tins of peaches or apricots and pour them into a sanitized, clean fermentation bucket. All those chunks and all that juice as well go straight in there. Once you've poured in your peaches, your four tins of peaches into your fermentation vessel, you want to pour over 1.2 kilos of sugar. We will be adding an extra 400 grams of sugar further on down the line. So now it's just 1.2 kilos to get that yeast started. The high sweetness level helps it oxidize and turn from a wine into a sherry. And now you want to pour over four liters of water, not the full gallon, because when you set out to make this recipe, you're not aiming to make a full gallon. The aim is to have a surface area, so you want to leave space in the demijohn, not fill it up right the way. So generally you would get five bottles of sherry per gallon instead of the standard six. So just pour your water over. I find that if you use boiling water, it gives a slight off flavor to the tin fruits. If I was making a parsnip sherry or a rice sherry, then I would add boiling water to help dissolve the sugar. Give it a good stir. With that well and truly stirred and the sugar dissolved into the liquid, you want to be adding a teaspoon of peptolase just to break down the peptic enzyme in the peaches or apricots. For this style of sweet sherry, there is no need to add a sherry yeast. 
you can use pretty much any yeast you want to. But I would try to go for either a mead yeast or a port yeast if you can get hold of them. A general purpose yeast would work, but I like the mead or port yeasts with the sherry. So sprinkle in your yeast or make up a yeast starter and pour that in. And that is the initial stage done. You now need to put a lid onto your bucket, stir it daily and keep it in a warm place for five to seven days. Let those peaches release the flavour. Let the yeast start eating the sugar and creating alcohol. Let them multiply, have a big, big party. So I will be back in five days or seven days to continue where I've left off. Hello, welcome back. Five days have passed and now it's time to get on and do our sherry making. It's been sat in the fermentation bucket, bubbling away nicely, it's all awesome. So now we need to extract that juice away from those peaches and into a clean, sterilized, sanitized demijohn. I'm simply going to use a siphon tube to siphon it into a clean demijohn. So come this way, let's do it together. That is looking and tasting awesome. It's sweet, it's peachy, it's peachy sweet. Whilst you are siphoning in the liquid into your demijohn, you want to break a cardinal rule of winemaking. You want to splash the liquid around the demijohn. You want to get as much air into the wine as you can. Normally, you try and do the opposite. You try and keep air and oxygen out of the wine so you keep everything smooth no splashes no bubbles you keep it calm but get that oxygen into the wine what we need to do now is add the extra 200 grams of sugar which we didn't add at the start of the fermentation i didn't add all the sugar in one go because i wanted the yeast to get going build up a good colony and be really really strong before i add this sugar because now I want a really quick fermentation with the rest of the sugar. With this wine, the sherry, you want to oxidate it. The reason you add so much sugar to make a sweet sherry is because you don't want any acetobacter to get in there and form vinegar. Generally, if a wine is over 15%, it is very resilient to acetobacter and very difficult to turn to vinegar. So check your hydrometer at various stages and do your calculations. You want your initial or your combined specific gravity readings to come up to 1.115. That equates to 15% ABV. Also, another winemaking rule we are breaking is not filling up the demijohn right the way up to the neck. We are leaving a big surface area because you want the oxygen to turn the wine into a sherry. By the very nature of a sherry, it is an oxidated wine. That's what you want. That's what you are aiming for in a sherry. In general terms, in winemaking, you do not want this to happen because you might end up with either vinegar or sherry. We are counteracting the vinegar by making the wine above 15% and we want the desired effect of a sherry style wine. So the next step is to add an airlock, which is empty. There's no liquid in this at all, which is the whole point. So insert your airlock, but don't add any liquid, any water, any spirits, any glycerin to it. Keep it empty. And that way you are going to allow the air and the oxygen in through the airlock to your wine. But you do not want any flies getting in there or dust or other particles. So you need to either stuff the airlock with cotton wool or cover it with a muslin cloth, a few layers, keep all that debris, all the dust and all the flies out. Or my personal favorite, something I've picked up along the way, is to use a sterilized crepe bandage. They do not need to be sterilized because it's gonna be in the air for a considerable amount of time. 
and it's not coming into contact with the wine itself. But I like these crepe bandages because they are slightly elasticated, they are very easy to wrap around and tie and get a nice tight seal of several layers around the top of your airlock. So that is what we're doing now. With your airlock covered over, with your airlock covered over with either, with your airlock stuffed with cotton wool or a crepe bandage or some cheesecloth and tied and secured, you are pretty much now in the realms of sherry making. You've broken a few home brewing rules. You've splashed your air around the liquid. You haven't topped up your demijohn and you've let your airlock go dry. Cardinal sins normally, but hey, you're making sherry. Fantastic, good job. You want your demijohn, your sherry to go through extremes of temperature fluctuations. You want it to go from cold to hot hot to cold on a regular basis. This helps the sherry floor to form. The floor being something that's gonna make it extra sherry-like. If it doesn't happen, not to worry, it's still gonna be this really awesome oxidized wine. This is why I don't recommend making a sherry to beginners. Because if you make a sherry, you do things the wrong way. Which is awesome, which is great if you know that you're breaking the fundamental do's and don'ts and you're don'ting the do's and doing the don'ts but if you don't know anything better and you learn to make wine this way the rest of your wines are going to be like sherry which is fine if you want to make sherry but if you don't want to make sherry you want to make normal wine do the don'ts and don't the do's another rule we're about to break you do not want to rack off the sediment of the sherry all this is going to do is enhance the flavor of the sherry and the peaches it's going to become better so now you want to put your sherry aside for six months you want it to build up that sediment you want it to clear and mature without a bung and without liquid in the airlock six months or so then have a quick taste and at that point you will say yep that is definitely an awesome sherry then you just need to mature it for another two or three years. Ideally, although you can drink it pretty much straight away after it's turned into sherry during this process. I probably will, I'm gonna get a few more five gallon batches on the go, which I would keep for longer term storage and maturation. But this one, I will try in six months time. Now I promised you a tip, didn't I? About keeping flies away from your home brew. Tip I've learned, and that is to put one clove into each airlock. As the airlock puffs out the carbon dioxide, it would also puff out a bit of the oil from the clove that's been diluted in the liquid. Flies do not like the oils and the fennels found in cloves. So they will keep a natural distance away from your fermenting demijohns and buckets. And if you want some more tips about winemaking, check out this playlist down by here. And I'll see you all really soon. Have fun now.